Almighty God, and to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from him no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify his holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Rabah, but David remained at Jerusalem. 
It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, and David asked how Joab and the people fared, and how the war was going, then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. Here endeth the lesson. Let us read the appointed selection of the Psalter in unison. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt and become abominable in their doings. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that would understand and seek after God. But they are all gone out of the way. They are all together abominable. There is none that do the good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues have they deceived. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and unhappiness is in their ways, and in the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Have they no knowledge that they are workers of mischief, eating up my people as and call not upon the Lord. They were made of great fear, even where no fear was. For God is the generation of the righteous. As for you, ye have made a mock at the counsel of the poor, because he put it to trust in the Lord. Who shall give salvation? When the Lord turneth the captivity of his people, then Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. A reading from the Epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. 
the third chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Here endeth the epistle. Jesus took the loaves, 
and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told the disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, based by those left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the signs that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who, who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But Jesus said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land for which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Who shall give salvation unto Israel out of Zion? When the Lord turneth the captivity of his people, then shall Jacob rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. You may be seated. It's a it's a familiar story, David and Bathsheba. We may know the details, but there is, there is much happening between the surface. It is something that David wants to do to go to battle, because I think he's gotten to the point that he doesn't know anything else and he's impatient, and he thinks that that is a good thing to do, to conquer all his neighbors. And so each spring he, he gathers an army and he sends them out. And so that is where this story begins, and that is a theme that runs throughout it. David doesn't go to battle. He's the king now, after all. Kings don't go to battle, and when they do, they stand at the, the back of the lines because it's safer back there. But David at home wanders out onto a balcony or a roof kind of situation, and he, he looks over and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. And he is deeply smitten with her. That's a nice way to suggest that he is by, uh, he is by himself unable to control himself. So he asked who she is, and they told her, told him, and then he asked that she be brought to him, and she was. And then as the, gospel, or the Old Testament reading says, 
the two of them glide together. And then she went back home. And it's an old story. Maybe one played out in our own families. Because Bathsheba finds that she's with child. And so she sends a message to David the king as to what has happened. And the first thing, and probably the fifth thing as well, David conspires not only with himself, but with a few close friends, a couple in the army, to take care of Uriah. And the goal is to get Uriah killed. It doesn't work. Uriah has different loyalties different concerns than David the king. Uriah is a team player, a team player where he would much rather spend time, in fact, spend the night sleeping among his comrades. And every morning, David and Uriah get up, and David asks Uriah some roundabout questions, trying to get information, but not in a direct fashion. And David finds that Uriah, Uriah never goes home. He sleeps in David's door, at David's door. He sleeps with other soldiers, but he does not go home. So David can't invent a scenario that would explain Bathsheba's pregnancy. So as what desperate people do, they do very desperate things. And David conspires to secure the death of Uriah, and he succeeds at that. And so now, Bathsheba is not encumbered with her marriage to Uriah, and David can bring her into the palace to be one of his concubines. It's a terrible story. Oh yes, it does reflect human, human inclination and the realities of people banging into each other because they are not able to perceive that we all deserve kindness and we all have a claim on a community morality that says that certain things must not be done. But David believes those rules aren't for him. They're really meant for someone else, not the king of Israel. And so he breaks the, rule, the rules. And when he does that, tragedy and fear both become entailed. What David has done is truly reprehensible. He has committed adultery. He has lied about it. We have attempted murder on the books, and we indeed have murder of Uriah as well, just as soon, just as if David had taken a knife and put it in Uriah's heart. And although this seems more inferential than the words on the page, Uriah seems on some level accurately to know what David is trying to do to him. 
And so David gets along with his life. The Sheba comes to the palace and everything simmers down for the, for the time being. Kings can do terrible things because unless they have inside them some kind of sense of moral boundary, they begin to think that they can do what they want to do. And that's what David thought, that he could do what he wanted to. And terrible things ensued. It appears that David didn't learn much of a, la of a lesson here. He just kept going as things piled on top of piles. He kept going. And it is not a keeping going that we should emulate. Because he was going down a road that would only lead to his own and the nation's self-destruction. God was with David the entire way. That's interesting, I think, for us to contemplate because we look at David as a fallen hero and leader, but someone who has done, as I called it, reprehensible things. But God sticks with David, does not send him into exile, rather, in some fashion, keeps him close. And it's the story will end. David has a good, clean, simple death. What are we to learn from this? I think that what we should learn is that it is so easy to slip slide away. If we are not vigilant, if we do not protect our moral center. Well, no one else will. But it takes us into territories that with a clearer mind we would avoid. David did not have a clearer mind. And his lack of a clearer morality was only exacerbated because he was the king. Now I think what happens is a kind of a kind of experience of hell because what else would you call it? What else could you possibly call it? C.S. Lewis the English writer, said the thing about hell that is so interesting is that the gates to hell are locked on the inside. In fact, we can open the gates any time that it strikes us to go on our way. We are bound indeed by our own sense of our own sin. And it's a heavy burden. Now I have lots of opinions about hell, but in terms of this particular story, the hell of the story is a metaphor, of course, but it also it also rings true. Lewis thinks, and I think he's right, that we create our own hell. We create a place where we deserve to go, but we like to be in because it's dark and it's out of the way and no one will confront us. But the awful truth is 
that we confront ourselves daily and we, we suffer because we cannot forgive ourselves. Another writer writes, God is quick to forgive his children if they anger him. And God is far more forgiving and loving than them. Sin hurts us and unfortunately often others too. Any punishment comes not from God, but from those effect, the devastation wrought and the broken relationships, the guilt and the shame. He continues, we trap ourselves in little personal hell loops of pain, remorse, shame, self-hatred, self-righteousness, excuses, wrath, lust, greed, greed, idolatry, and more. But the truth is we could be free if we chose. It's hard to put our arms around sin and our own sinfulness, capital S, the way of dealing with that is self-forgiveness and as the confession says, a true and changed heart which leads to a changed life. This is why we're here this morning. I think this is why we go out into the world with a self-knowledge that is called Christian. But it's up to us to say no to us, just as it would have been good if David could have said no to himself. He did not and should have, and we should too. It's scary to imagine C.S. Lewis's observation that the gate of hell is locked from within. And we are bound to say that, stay there of our own volition because we don't recognize what we've done to ourselves and by extension of that to other people. This story is one of the great texts in the world of religious storytelling throughout history. And I would suggest to everyone, including myself, we are so hard on ourselves, give ourselves a break. And understanding what binds us is something that we ourselves have a large control of and we should exert that control. And to understand that God is a forgiving and merciful God and God forgives us perhaps even before we've done that sin that we have engaged in. But God does not want us to go out into the world with the heavy yoke of sinfulness. God wants us to go out into the world in the spirit of redemption, of resurrection, of forgiveness. So the story of David is quite the ca cautionary tale. And I would invite you to think about it because there's a lot there and it hits all of us square in the heart. Sin is not rare. It is abundant. But what's more abundant is the forgiving love of God God's self. Let us bless the Lord.
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, God not made, being the one substance.